Hi, my name is Christine Lee. I'm from Cushman and Wayfield. I take charge of research for Singapore and Southeast Asia. And thank you so much for Connect and British Chamber of Commerce Singapore for inviting me to do this session on the Singapore Office Market 2020. So if we look back um, in 2019, it was already a quite a challenging year for the Singapore office market. And 2020 uh, is off to start with a coronavirus situation, which is still fast developing. So what on Occupy's mind is really how this 2020 will pan out for the office market in Singapore. And what strategies do they have if they were to uh, renew or relocate to a new office building? So I'm going to uh, address that in the next 20 minutes or so. So if we look back in 2019, we see that there are three different trends uh, about the state of the market. So the first one is that the rental growth is actually signaling that the rents are nearing the peak of the market. And if you look at the demand, it's mainly driven by the finance, technology and co-working. And finally, if you look at the supply side, we do have very limited supply, but the secondary stock is also growing. If we look at the state of the market in 2019, in fact, for the past three quarters, uh, starting from the second quarter of 2019, the rental growth is actually pretty flat. So basically, the landlords in Singapore have lost the ability to increase rents in view of the uncertain situations, especially because the trade war between US and China is still evolving, and that's uh, weighing on the sentiment on a lot of occupiers. That's why we are not seeing the rental growth as fast as uh, previously anticipated. And for the whole of 2019, it only grew by about 2% uh, for the whole year. If we analyze the leasing demand, you can see that a large portfolio of the leasing profile in 2018 is actually driven by finance, uh, tech sector, and the real estate. But if you look at 2019, we see that tech companies is still growing. Finance is mainly driven by rationalization of the space. But a big pie of the leasing is actually contributed by co-working. Co-working operators took up more than a million square feet in 2019. And that's basically going to impact how things are moving next year. If we delve deeper into the sectors, you can see that the finance sector, especially the banking sector, they are struggling. Even early this year, we can see that HSBC has announced a job cut of 35,000 people um, in the years to come. And last year, we saw that another European bank, uh, Commerce Bank, is planning to release 60,000 people. If you look at the job losses uh, by this Bloomberg chart, uh, bulk of the um, retrenchment is actually happening in the European banks, uh, followed by North America and Asia Pacific. And for the technology companies, we know that they have been catching up in terms of the demand for office space. In fact, the traditional tech companies are still growing, especially if you look at some of the tier one tech companies. They are Headcom projection is still very aggressive uh, in the next couple of years. So, for example, this tech company, basically you can see that their headcount requirement and the space requirement almost double in the next four years. But 2019 is also an interesting year for some of the tech unicorns because in the past, a lot of these tech unicorns, once they have a good concept, regardless of their profitability, they will be favored by investors. But because of uh, the IPO of WeWork, I think there's a lot of focus back on these tech unicorns to look at the profitability of the business rather than just the concept. And that's the year actually a lot of the tech unicorns they became donkeys according to this uh, Business Times article, which means in the year ahead, there will be less of an expansion in terms of the real estate need, especially for tech unicorns who are not doing that well on their balance sheet. 
And if you look at the co-working expansion, it is also slowing, uh, not just because of the failed IPO of WeWork, but if you look at this uh, chart on the right, you can see that uh, mature co-working operators are actually not going to survive in 2019, actually, there is a reduction of the co-working operators uh, five years and older. And there's also a reduction of the new co-working players entering this very crowded market. So on the whole, actually, there's uh, room for consolidation uh, in the co-working space, which has shown up in some of the countries or cities, for example, this KR space, co-working operators from China have already given up facilities in Hong Kong. But in the immediate future, we can see that the supply is fairly limited. So on the historical average, you can see that um, demand is around 1 million square feet per year and supply is about 1.2 million square feet per year. So Singapore is pretty balanced in terms of the demand supply dynamics. And that's why we are seeing very low vacancy rate in 2019, because in 2018, we saw the co-working operators and also other uh, occupiers took up huge spaces uh, in, the, in the CBD, taking advantage of uh, lower rents. And that's uh, giving you a very low vacancy rate of 2.3%. This will have an uh, um, a, a impact on the availability of the space in the market. And that's impacting on the rents. But the secondary space is growing as well because most of these uh, leases have been uh, driven by a lot of these uh, space rationalization. So a lot of musical chair movements. And um, so in terms of the net growth in demand, it is not really that aggressive. But at the same time, we're also seeing some of these uh, secondary space, particularly by the relocation of the tenants in the previous building. For example, JP Morgan, uh, they are leaving Capital Tower to go to Capital Spring. Although the space uh, uh, it remains the same, but there will be a lot of space to be backfilled uh, in the years to come. So despite the pretty healthy fundamentals for 2019, we're seeing risks uh, rising in the global economic uh, environment, as well as some of the black swan events that's happening. So we have summarized it in three main points. One is the weakness across the US and Eurozone. Um, the other one, the low interest rate environment could even trigger uh, the global recession. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, that's probably going to impact the Singapore GDP growth. And those will have um, some wide-ranging impact on the Singapore office market. So if we look at this uh, CEO confidence survey, actually CEO confidence level has been the lowest since the global financial crisis. This has been uh, before the COVID-19 um, situation, which means a lot of the CEOs are already expecting uh, the growth in the top line to be pretty muted. And that's why they are looking more closely at the bottom line and real estate cost is usually the first uh, item to be reviewed by all these CEOs. So that's going to have impact on how leases are being negotiated, whether they have the capacity to go into a brand new building paying higher rents, and that's going to have an impact on the uh, overall um, investment into the real estate. The other one is the low interest rate environment because we are seeing a lot of these uh, negative yielding uh, products in the market. For example, Greece was almost uh, broke four years ago. And in today's environment, actually investors are paying to lend it money because everything else is just very, very uh, low return with low yielding. And this will have some implications later on. If you look at the total negative debt in the world, about 15 trillion debt is actually negative yielding. So investors are actually paying money to lend money to buy these uh, negative yielding products. 
And what this means to the industry is that it might even trigger the next global financial crisis because a lot of these uh, insurers, they realize if they were to keep up with the rates that they are distributing to their shareholders or their investors, they will have to take high risk. So one of the products that surfaced during this period is actually the CLO. Um, it's called the Collateralized Loan Debt Obligation. And this is pretty similar to what caused the global financial crisis, the subprime crisis, because a lot of these insurers, they just buy a portfolio of bonds backed by all these corporate bonds. And they are not even sure whether these bonds uh, are super safe because uh, the, basically the returns uh, are more attractive than your, your usual government bonds. And when many insurers are buying these products, I think there is this concern raised by the Financial Stability Board to see whether some of the insurers are taking too much risk. And this does not help when US is already on the longest expansion trail in history because by July 2nd, 2019, it is already uh, into their 121 months of expansion and a lot of these companies uh, uh, basically have lost the momentum in terms of the growth in the top line and that will have some impact on the prospects going forward. And with the coronavirus situation that's uh, fast evolving since the beginning of 2020, we are seeing the earlier projections about recovery in 2020 um, seems to be pretty unlikely because uh, quite a number of sectors have been impacted, especially in terms of entertainment such as casino, airline, hotel, food and beverage and retail. But we are also seeing some bright spots uh, in sectors such as digital entertainment, online gaming, uh, delivery service, uh, e-commerce, as well as cloud computing. So when written in Chinese, the word crisis actually consists of two characters. One is danger, the other one actually represents opportunity. And let's look at some of the opportunities in the market. If we look back uh, 20 years ago when SARS happened, we think that um, the impact to the system is still quite short-lived. Although SARS lasted for about 10 months since the beginning of the virus outbreak, we can see that in the following year in Singapore tourism, actually the number recovered pretty fast. And uh, during SARS period, we saw that visitor arrivals uh, fell by about 20% year on year. But it is still encouraging because in the following year, we actually saw some pent up demand in the visitor arrival. And thereafter, we see a V-shaped recovery. And in terms of the GDP impact by SARS, it is also not as severe as the dot-com bubble burst. So if you look at um, 2001, during the dot-com bubble burst, we saw that the economy actually went into a tailspin since the first quarter of 2001, and it did not recover after four quarters later. But for the SARS period, where uh, the virus situation is pretty similar to what we are experiencing now. Um, the drop in the GDP is only for the two quarters. And the subsequent quarter, we actually saw the reshape recovery again. And in terms of the GDP impact and the prices, the asset prices, we saw that uh, a real recession scenario is actually having a much uh, deeper impact compared to a virus outbreak such as SARS. Because during the uh, period where you have the dot-com bubble burst, as well as the global financial crisis, you can see asset prices actually drop a lot more as compared to during the SARS period. And of course, the uh, economies are not so positive about the GDP growth in some of these countries, especially when uh, the economy was already in a slow, slow mode 
For example, Singapore, you can see that previously our forecast was 1%, and it has since been downgraded to 0.3%. Similarly for Hong Kong, it was already in a recession because of the riots and um, uh, protest. And you can see with the coronavirus situation, uh, the recession has gone deeper uh, into the city. So if we do a comparison between SARS global financial crisis and the current coronavirus uh, situation, you can see that um, during SARS, actually the impact was pretty muted. Uh, the grade A office rents at only dropped by 16%. But this is also against the backdrop that the state of the economy was already weak before the uh, SARS outbreak. But during the global financial crisis, the market actually reacted quite strongly to the uh, crisis. And you can see that uh, in terms of the grade A office rents, it dropped by uh, 55% uh, in uh, a short period of time. But the rebound was also much faster as compared to the, the GFC with SARS. You can see uh, even the, the four quarters after SARS, the uh, office rents only rose by 2.6% versus uh, during the GFC when we had the V-shaped recovery, the office rents actually uh, almost recover half of what has been lost during the GFC. So going on to coronavirus pandemic, you can see that we probably don't think that the impact is going to be as severe as GFC. Um, looking at the timeline, we think that um, the virus outbreak perhaps will worsen uh, in the month to come, but probably will not extend uh, more than uh, two to three quarters. And uh, in terms of the uh, state of the market, we are already experiencing slower growth. So in terms of the downside, it is probably going to mirror uh, the SARS period where there's lot already uh, limited downside. And in terms of the rebound, it depends on how Singapore and the global economy pan out in the next few quarters. Okay. So in summary, you can see that um, basically rents will uh, moderate in 2020 due to all the economic headwinds in the market. But the rental drop is not going to be very pronounced. At this juncture, we think that the market is probably uh, going through a correction phase of about 5%. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, um, this is basically cushioned by the tight supply situation in the grade A market. But uh, if the coronavirus situation persists, we can see that landlords are going to become a lot more reasonable in terms of their asking rents because uh, tenants are basically taking a very cautious and wait-and-see attitude. That's going to have an impact on their cash flow. Okay. We are also seeing some opportunities in the market. Um, on the co-working operator's uh, side, we can see that according to this survey by Desmet, interestingly, 50% of the co-working operators actually do not fear a crisis. In fact, Singapore is a regional hub for a lot of the global headquarters, and some of these MNCs have already had more plans to uh, increase the flexible space in these uh, co-working uh, spaces because they feel that, that in the event, if there is a business continuity plan, they will need more flexible space. So that has been supporting the co-working operators in Singapore. And the Hong Kong protests, which sort of stopped after the coronavirus outbreak, but the damage has already been done in the past couple of months. And we already saw some capital outflow from Hong Kong to Singapore. Um, and uh, this will have uh, an impact on uh, basically uh, the demand side of the Singapore office market because we are receiving funds and perhaps uh, family office demand uh, into the city. And the reason why some of these Hong Kong companies are looking at Singapore is also because of the rental gap that we are seeing in the Hong Kong and the office market. Because 
all along Singapore market, if you look at uh, the, the, the performance, it's usually quite cyclical and the government is very proactively uh, making sure Singapore business is always competitive. And the rental gap between Hong Kong and Singapore currently stands at 137%, which means it's a lot more attractive to come to Singapore. So the key takeaways for the audience is that uh, definitely the growth is slowing in US and Eurozone, and there will be a likely recession scenario in 2020 and 2021. Uh, Singapore's grade A office uh, in 2020 were moderate because of the headwinds and also the ongoing uh, COVID-19. And for the strategies for landlord, we know that um, tenants are uh, probably not able to um, increase their rental budget in the years to come. And it will be wise to sign as many early renewals as possible to prevent the rents from uh, dropping further. And landlords of upcoming projects also should take some immediate action to boost the pre-commitment rates. And the strategies for occupiers, I think this is a great opportunity for them to come back to the landlords uh, to assess whether they should take a flight to quality strategy during the upcoming down cycle and probably try to lock in some favorable rental rates with uh, long-term leases. Thank you so much for your attention, and I hope you find the presentation insightful. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Singapore Market Outlook 2020. I'm Sylvia Colgretton from Capital Land, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, I'm sure you found uh, Christine's presentation earlier on very insightful. Now, before we get into the panel discussion, how about we first get to know our panelists? Um, maybe Christine, Tim and Stuart, you can have a quick introduction of yourself. Sure. I'm Christine Lee. I'm from Cushman & Wayfield, and I take charge of the research for the region, uh, including Singapore and Southeast Asia. I'm Tim Armstrong from Knight Frank. I head up the Occupier Services and Commercial Agency for Knight Frank across Asia Pacific. And I'm Stuart Ross. Uh, I work at JLL and I run our industrial business for Southeast Asia based here in Singapore. Okay, good. Let's get right into it. Um, I think at the top of many people's mind uh, and a topic that has a lot of airtime in Christine's presentation just now uh, is the impact of COVID-19 on um, the real estate um, sector. Well, as one of the largest landlords in Singapore, uh, Capital Land has certainly seen quite a bit of impact to our tenants, especially the, the retail tenants uh, in recent months. Uh, Tim and Stewart, what are you seeing in the office and industrial segment of the market? And are there any positive angles at all um, off the back of the current climate? Um, Tim, do you want to go Yeah, first? sure. I mean, I think the thing is it's such an evolving situation. Mm. So each week it's changing. Um, so it is one to try and keep across and try and keep it on top of. Um, I think what we're seeing, though, it's almost like a big social experiment. I think the positive that will come out is that Businesses are looking at their contingency plans, mm. um, working from home. I don't think through a lot of Asia, working from home has been a, a cultural mm. norm. So I think it's it's forcing businesses to look at their strategies, look at how they do things differently. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the real upside, like I said, there's still a long way to play out. So I think um, there needs to be sort of calm and, mm. and caution and, and not sort of the... Uh, the rush and, and the concern that we're seeing in some other markets at the moment. But I think Singapore as a whole, uh, the way it's all been handled here has been mm. really, really positive. I think the government's done a great job. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's somewhat calm and steady at the moment for mm -hmm. Singapore. But mm -hmm. yeah, certainly businesses are, are really paying attention and, and having to look at different models, uh, different ways of working. So I think in the long term, I think there's a real positive to come out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Sylvia, I'd, I'd agree with Tim in terms of, uh, I think the government here is doing a great job in controlling, um, you know, the risks around uh, around the COVID nineteen, um, you know, controlling uh, how businesses uh, interact with each other. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there are some potential positives, particularly for e commerce um, on the industrial side, uh, mm. where uh, you know people might get more comfortable in staying at home uh, mm. or staying at the office uh, and 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 buying product online. Uh, mm. I think that's going to be potentially an upside. 
uh, for, for the industrial market. Mm -hmm. But without a doubt, we've seen a production uh, disruption, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly with China, um, you know, halting production for a few months now. Mm -hmm. So it's getting back up and running up there from the, mm -hmm. the data that we've, uh, we've seen coming through. Mm -hmm. um, but there's going to be some interruption there in terms of uh, delivery of goods, um, and we, we're going to have to wait and see you know, how that plays out in the marketplace. Right. And I think probably the volumes and all that will have to be catched up in the second half of the year if, um, fingers crossed, this goes goes away. Absolutely. I think if we, if we look back to, um, you know, 2003, where we had the SARS situation, which we're mm. trying to draw some comparisons with that mm -hmm. uh, in the market today, I think yeah. definitely the second half of that year, we saw a huge increase in uh, productivity and, uh, and a catch up of, of what was lost in the early mm. part of that period. And mm. I think we're going to see the same thing here. Okay. Well, that's good to know. So, Christine, do you see any difference in the speed and intensity of the market reaction for COVID-19 uh, compared to, say, SARS or GFC? Yes, definitely. Because in 2003, China's GDP is only about 4% of the world GDP, but today they are about 20% of the GDP. Mm. And you notice that all the Chinese consumers are ba basically buying up the world. Whenever they go travel, the whole, the town basically is booming with all these uh, purchases uh, uh, by the Chinese consumers. Mm. Um, but I think the biggest impact will be to see how this uh, global uh, supply chain disruption is uh, rippling through um, some of the other markets mm -hmm. outside China. Because uh, today, if you open up an iPhone, you can see all the parts are actually made in different countries, not just made in China, maybe some made in Thailand, Vietnam, and even the US. Mm -hmm. So it is very interlinked. Um, uh, the whole world in terms of manufacturing and with the whole Chinese city being in lockdown for a month, I think there is uh, a lot to catch up. So previously, some of the companies uh, in the in uh, say Europe or US, they might have some infantries, but it's not going to last them. Um, that's why we feel that um, the, the actual impact probably will start to appear maybe in April, from April onwards. So the second quarter is quite crucial. And I think um, the economy will uh, really be hit because of this uh, global supply chain disruption. So in terms of the intensity, it's really mm -hmm. uh, quite severe as compared to SARS. And if we talk about GFC, because uh, it's a different kind of crisis, basically mm. it's just one sector that's pulling down the entire economy. Um, but this time around, I think there is um, some risk in terms of how these investors and occupiers are uh, uh, reacting to the virus situation because they don't know what to do. And this is like really a black swan event because previously we were talking about recessions in the US. But when people are actually mentally prepared, they have contingency mm. plans. They don't know. They know what to do. But for this time, um, with the COVID nineteen, I think there's a lot of unknown, a lot of panic, uh, scrambling uh, mm -hmm. around the business strategy. I see. Well, I think in your presentation um, and uh, looking at sort of the leasing demand uh, over the last two years, um, you know, one of the fastest growing sector um, is co working, obviously, and. Um, Given the current uncertainty, you know, how is the sector expected to perform in 2020? Um, last year, um, off the back of a certain IPO that um, didn't go through, uh, there were many analysts who said that, you know, co-working has not been tested in a recession. And, you know, when, when it does, uh, you know, demand's going to shrink, they're going to go bust. You know, while we're not quite in a recession yet, um, this could be the start of a downturn, as Christine just mentioned. Uh, Tim, what are your views on the state of play for co-working today? Yeah, I think I mean, it's a really interesting point, an interesting question you raise. I mean, it has been untested. The model hasn't been tested through a, a downturn or a recession. So in many ways, we're, we're jumping at shadows a bit and we can only uh, speculate. But look, I think the model is, is proven to work. So I do think the model is here to stay. I think what's happened in that space is there's probably been too many players now. So I think there might be uh, a bit of survival of the fittest in that space. Mm. I think um, probably some zombie companies have sort of survived with the low interest rate environment as well. So I think now with revenue uh, probably going to take a hit for business in general, that will flow onto the co-working space. And I think now you might just see some consolidation. I, I, mm. I think, I mean, you pick markets like India, there's over 500 co-working players there. I think that's just too many. So I mm. think what you will see is, you know, the, the, the strong ones with a 
a stronger model, probably uh, carrying less debt or, or having good backing will probably weather the storm. I think it's probably the, the newer entrants that probably aren't as established um, and don't carry the, the good customer books. But I, look, I, I think the model's here to stay. I think that, that flex and that, that mm. agility is what occupiers want. So I think they will ride it out, but um, yeah, we, I think we'll see some attrition. Mm. I think it will also, there, there will probably be some, um, I guess, evolution of, of the sector as well, because um, obviously landlords like you know Capital Land, we, we have um, got some um, plans with regards to how we want to do the flex piece uh, in our buildings. And um, you know, to your point, those that have strong backing, uh, particularly of say landlord getting in collaboration with the landlords, um, that probably will be kind of one one bit of the sector that um, we're going to see quite a big um, growth going forward as well. Mm. Um, well, Stuart, I mean, the, the office segment has co-working. Uh, do you see any kind of uh, disintermediation happening uh, in the industrial sector uh, in Singapore or elsewhere in the region? Absolutely. I think it's something that, uh, you know, the industrial sector, we, we haven't seen it in any great way to date. Um, however, I think um, most companies and most investment companies uh, are trying to disrupt themselves mm. before they're disrupted by somebody else. And I think our sector is is definitely uh, open to change uh, and adaptation. And I think we're going to follow from what happens in the office sector and other sectors in uh, the sharing economy. Um, so mm. whilst we haven't seen a, a great level of investment into sort of sharing uh, and co-working in the industrial sector, mm. uh, I know that uh, some companies, in particular here in, in Singapore, JTC, for example, is, is looking at potential models where they can build facilities, um, you know, perhaps bring in an operator, uh, and look to uh, make space available for multiple users um, under somewhat of a co-sharing type of arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, but look, we haven't seen it a lot. We've seen uh, other areas where there are um, uh, companies, you know, trying to sell vacant space that, that is sitting within occupier buildings, uh, which is generally not available to the to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Normally, it's only investors properties that are mm. available to the marketplace. But when you've got occupiers um, not utilising vacant space within buildings, um, there's already been a, a number of companies trying to take advantage of that space mm -hmm. uh, around uh, the marketplace, particularly in the US, which is where a lot of these things originate. Mm -hmm. um, but look, there's, there's going to be changes. You know, we're, we're moving very quickly. The world's changing. The industrial market's going to have to keep up. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, we've got lots of you know great discussions and, and thoughts around what's happening now. Um, let's pivot our discussion to what the future holds uh, for Singapore. Uh, in you know, Christine, in this market, um, the government policies play a very important role as it heavily influences um, the supply condition. Um, you know, what can you tell us about what the planning authorities have in mind for the office and industrial segments in Singapore? I think for Singapore, um, in the past, at least for the past 20 or 30 years, Singapore is always uh, put to compare with Hong Kong and in terms of the uh, cost. So the mm -hmm. government has been very proactive whenever they see the business cost go up. That's why whenever we have a shortage of office space, especially in the CBD, um, they realize they need to put in the supply. That's why every two years and three years, the government will always put a, a confirmed site uh, in Marina Bay. You can see we have a lot of land reclamation, mm -hmm. and that's uh, probably another 20 to 30 percent uh, in terms of the office infantry in the CBD. But just over the last five years, we noticed that the government probably had this change of heart. They feel that... Um, Previously, they want to push uh, companies out of the CBD because uh, basically it can ease the infrastructure. Um, but uh, companies are unwilling because whenever there is a supply mm -hmm. and rents come down to seven, eight dollars, and that's when companies actually make a lot of move uh, within the CBD. They don't want to move outside the CBD. And the uh, government feels that probably the carrot and stick uh, approach uh, mm -hmm. should be more gravitating towards stick, which means they need the rents to be so high that companies have no choice but to move to decentralized area. Sure. So for the last uh, three years, after the uh, office market 
rental recovered by about 25% in the great ACBD. So now we are seeing double-digit rents and some of the MNCs are actually uh, voicing their unhappiness uh, because the business cost, especially the real estate cost, is mm -hmm. high. Um, but the government doesn't do anything. Um, basically, they just uh, had some CBD incentive scheme in the latest master plan, but that's encouraging landlords to do redevelopment rather than them pushing out a, a brand new site. So companies have been looking at uh, mm -hmm. sub, uh, suburban areas or even the city fringe areas like this building, uh, Maple Tree Business City. So those are the things that the government has in mind. And I think the rental gap currently um, is not attractive enough for companies to move out. So in future, probably we will see um, CBD rents going up a, 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 a bit uh, a bit more and uh, city fringe locations um, largely being uh, very stable. Right. <clears throat> okay. And what about the industrial sector? Industrial sector is interesting because uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, MNCs uh, actually taking up business park space, uh, especially if they do R&D, they do advanced mm -hmm. manufacturing, uh, especially the pharmaceutical companies. They have been looking around for these kind of areas um, because they feel business park, because of the high specs, they can use both as the uh, R&D center as well as the ancillary office. Mm -hmm. So some of these MNCs have been uh, looking for sites, uh, sometimes even built to suit. They feel that uh, it's better to probably get uh, their own building uh, mm -hmm. customized to the type of work they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are seeing quite a lot of notes. And uh, in the next foreseeable 10 years, I would say we are going to see the Jurong Innovation District, mm -hmm. the Pongo Digital District that's coming up with a lot of business park space. Mm -hmm. And that's going to attract uh, clusters of companies who are specialized in those areas to go to those nodes. So mm -hmm. it's again, going to push the decentralization strategy uh, mm -hmm. ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think the, um, and also the, the pure, pure industrial um, sort of manufacturing sites mm. um, and so on. Uh, one thing is that they are really changing, um, you know, it's no longer the, the what I'll term as the dirty manufacturing, it's all going high tech, um, value add manufacturing. Uh, and that will continue to be out in the, the east and also parts of the north, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I think for uh, the normal uh, manufacturing, of course, the government wants uh, the industrialists to up the game. Sure. And that's uh, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about Industry 4.0. And those factories actually uh, can't really be uh, those manufacturing can't really be done in the conventional factory. I think mm. the specs has to evolve as well. And that's when your Jurong Innovation District comes about because uh, although they are catering to some of these uh, MNCs uh, doing a bit of R&D, but they are also looking at how to integrate maybe tertiary institutions mm. together with the industrialists because they feel that the future is really about innovation and how you do your manufacturing, how you collaborate maybe even with the region is very important. Mm. Well, that's really interesting because it reminds me of um, the Haidian district in, in Beijing, isn't it? Where, where um, Tsinghua mm. University and the uh, manufacturing, high-tech manufacturing um, actually collaborated really well in, in that um, high-tech part there. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, now, Tim and Stuart, what are your predictions in terms of um, the, the um, drivers that could drive demand um, for the office and industrial segment? Um, because, you know, obviously, as, as Christine pointed out, the government is trying to decentralise uh, for the industrial sector. They are trying to introduce or, or encourage uh, more high-tech value-add sort of activities. Um, do you think there will be sufficient demand, um, you know, to, to absorb all the supply that the government's planning for, particularly outside of the CBD? Yeah, yeah I mean, I'll touch on um, the office sector. And I'll, just to go back to what Christine said about the decentralisation, the rent is a factor, but so is a cultural fit for a business and, and retention and recruitment of staff. So mm. it's one thing to, to take your business from a, a CBD building and put them into a suburban, more suburban location, but it also has to be a cultural alignment with the business. It has to, you know, we hear day in, day out that it's all about 
getting the best staff and the best people. So um, a business has to weigh up the cost benefits with those other factors. Um, you know, if, you, if you're going to lose good people along the way and it's not the right fit. And I also think for some businesses, um, you know, that, 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 that's what they need to try and fight against some of the, the bigger companies as well. They need a good office space. It needs to be in the right area as well. So I think there's a few factors that will play in. And I think it's not just a pure rent or, or economic call or financial call, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of drivers, I mean, the, the tech sector has been such a big, big driver um, over the last few years. I think that's going to continue. I think finance will, will remain robust. I, I think a lot of probably some bigger decisions might get put on hold over the next few months, just while businesses try to work out what's, mm. what's going to play out. Um, so I think getting sign off on, on big capital um, expenditure could be a bit of a challenge for some businesses at the moment. But certainly, I mean, the tech sector, we think, will, will, will continue to be robust. TikTok took 60,000 square metres, um, so yeah. 60,000 square feet, I should say, um, in, in the CBD. So I think businesses like that will continue. Like I said, finance will keep going. I think life sciences and, and pharmaceuticals, I think we'll see the importance of that sector now, given what's going on. So. Mm-hmm. I think again they will continue to to um, power through, but I think they're they're probably the the three, and then co working. I think we'll we'll see what what happens, happens in that space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll watch it with with interest. Mm. And Tim, you, you you mentioned just now that um, you know for companies to go to a decentralized location, uh, rent is just one of the factor. In your work with occupiers who have successfully you know made that transition, um, what what were some of the uh, you know, factors or, or reasons that um, that encourage them to make that move? Yeah, I mean, that, that staff amenity is key. Mm. So having access to uh, good food and beverage outlets, to gyms, um, childcare, those type of things are factors. Obviously, close to transport is uh, an important aspect. So having good public transport amenity, um, staff don't want to work sorry, walk more than five to ten minutes in the heat here in Singapore. <laughs> so that's something to, to factor into. So... Um, yeah, just staff amenity and like I said, that, that real cultural alignment. But I looked, I think the benefit for Singapore as opposed to a lot of Southeast Asia and, and probably most cities in the world is that really even if you move, you're a 20 to 30 minute journey further. Some some cities that can be hours, it can be an hour or two. Yeah, but 30 or, minutes is too long. Yeah, well, for Singapore it is. <laughs> so, but uh, not for, not in, in some places that's a luxury to, to only have to travel an extra 30 minutes. So, um, yeah, we can get a bit spoiled here for sure. Indeed. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, Stuart, what do you think about the industrial um, uh, segment? I mean, so what, what are going to be the key demand drivers going forward, you think? Well, I think, I think in times of uncertainty, you know, companies look to de-risk. Uh, and I think particularly at, at, in this time uh, that we're in with, uh, with this global uh, issue uh, with COVID-19, I think, you know, Singapore stands out as a brand uh, and as a, as a country where, mm. you know, risk is really uh, managed extremely well in mm. comparison. And particularly as a... Uh, as a country within Southeast Asia, where there's a lot of developing countries still uh, on the boundaries here, I think you know Singapore really stands above as the safest place uh, to mm-hmm. invest into. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's very well controlled. The government has a very strong focus of maintaining a high level of uh, you know, skilled labour, um, the right uh, efficiencies of, of transport infrastructure, uh, governance, uh, and those types of issues uh, or those factors are really important at, at a time like this where companies are looking to Asia Pacific as probably the, the growth region for the next decade at least, mm-hmm. if not beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, from, from both, uh, you know, an office perspective um, and an industrial sp- perspective, I think we're in a, in a very safe place mm-hmm. for companies to get comfortable to mm-hmm. invest here. I mean, certainly we're trying to move up the value chain here in terms of manufacturing, uh, into, mm-hmm. you know, Industry 4.0 and mm-hmm. There's a lot of push there, and it makes sense because you know there's not cheap labour availability here as there is in other other locations. Um, but when you're investing into automation, into higher tech uh, auto, uh, manufacturing and, and production, you need to invest somewhere where you know you're going to get the economic life out of your investment. Mm. And I think here in Singapore, you get that mm. uh, without a doubt beyond uh, you know other other locations uh, in the region. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of positives for Singapore moving forward. Um, we're also a major hub for Asia in terms of logistics. Mm. So you know, transshipment here is huge. Uh, you don't have to look very far um, out to sea to see you know, how busy uh, the, the, uh, the waterways are here in Singapore, mm. and that's going to continue 
uh, as, it, as it has been mm -hmm. for decades already. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from a logistics perspective as well, uh, a lot of companies are investing here, they're innovating, um, they're using this as a base for uh, their major uh, hub operations um, for, mm -hmm. for Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. And what about data centers? I, I think, you know, that was one of the key pillar of growth um, that the Singapore government was, was trying to push for in the last couple of years. Um, how is that kind of um, taking shape, you think? Well, it's been very strong, obviously, you know, the data center investment here in Singapore, uh, you know, with some very large recent transactions. I think my experience with data centers uh, and having spent 12 years in China uh, where data centers came mm. uh, very aggressively, but then the government, you know, started to pull back, is that data centers, uh, they, they do uh, tap a lot of resources. Um, they take a lot of uh, electricity um, and, and you really find that the, the, the major data center operators, they want to de-risk uh, all areas of, uh, of, of potential uh, risk. And so, look, I think Singapore, again, as a safe haven uh, within Asia Pacific and as, as a hub, um, is going to be the first port of call for a lot of companies wanting to have data stored mm. uh, and managed uh, mm. here. Uh, and I think the government will control, um, you know, how many users uh, and operators come in. Mm. Uh, and I think it will still continue to be um, a driving force. There's, there's a multitude of alternate investment classes that have come mm. out of the traditional industrial area, you know, mm. education um, and data centres, aged care, a lot of these different types of, um, of investments that uh, many of the investors, so much money trying to find a, a place to, uh, to, to invest here into Singapore. Um, mm. Data centres has certainly been a very strong area. Mm. Uh, but I think there's limitations as to, you know, how many occupiers and how much investment mm. you can get into data centres uh, in mm. one location. And I think it's going to be um, an area as, as businesses digitise and, and the world digitises, um, data centres are, are here to stay and they're going to be very uh, popular investments uh, and developments across the whole of uh, the global economy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in, in you know Singapore um, has this big green agenda and, and needing to go to be a more sustainable um, city and so on. And uh, you know I, I, I personally I struggle a little bit with with uh, that kind of goal versus trying to push for data center. Uh, and obviously I think the data centers have gotten greener and more energy efficient um, over time. A lot of innovation going into that space. But um, again, you know compared to the traditional office. Um, or even your traditional industrial, I mean, that's still a big gap. Mm -hmm. um, Christine, I think um, uh, there were also some talks uh, about having an underground city in, in Singapore in some of the plans. Yes. Um, how, how is that going? Well, it's actually quite interesting because uh, last year, I think the government actually called for a design concept um, of an underground data centre. Mm. <laughs> and uh, that's the first in the world. And considering uh, how expensive construction cost is mm. for Singapore, because you're going underground and it's for data center, it is really the first in the world. But of course, uh, after evaluating the bids, the government decided not to award <laughs> to the sole bidder. I think that's it's a, a lot. Bidder. Of, it's a so bitter, okay. yeah. But um, I think maybe the price came in a bit too low, considering how expensive it is. Um, Although this is uh, not going to take off in any uh, in any time soon, but I feel this is the right step towards you know uh, finding the potential underground because a lot of these uh, asset classes um, basically they don't really need uh, above ground um, you know facilities. For example, warehouse storage, you can definitely go underground because you don't really need. Lighting, you don't really need the, the so-called circulation because it's just for goods. That's and uh, we do have uh, a lot of uh, uh, spaces, uh, especially in the western part of Singapore. They can have uh, up to maybe 30 meters underground. So that's a lot of things to, to actually what? consider. Eight stories on the ground. Yeah, and yeah. If, you, if you go to some of these uh, um, uh, big cities like even Hong Kong or Tokyo, you can see actually underground is also perfect for shopping. 
for retail. So My that's... retail rents can't get that high on the ground, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer it upstairs. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but with the heat in Singapore, I think uh, it's something that can be explored sure. because uh, if you free up the land on, on, on the surface and you go underground for retail, and you can have a lot more nature in this, uh, in this mm, garden, the city. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a great idea for you, Stuart. Maybe you can start looking at underground data centre solutions for your clients. <laughs> well, the government will love that. No employment, no tax yeah. revenue. It's all Fully automated, <laughs> robots roam the underground Heavy, in, heavy space. investment density, which is, which is a positive. <laughs> um, and last question for the day. Um, if you can use one word to predict what 2020 will hold for real estate, uh, what will it be and um, why? Stuart, do you want to go for it? Sure. I think... I think in, in a word, I think reboot. Um, I think it's time, uh, particularly with what's happening uh, you know, globally uh, with the, the coronavirus. I think a lot of companies are going to look at the last 10 years uh, in particular as a very strong growth sector. I mean, every asset class uh, from equities to real estate to everything is, uh, is, is, is talked about being you know, mm. at the top of its cycle. So I think uh, this is a, an opportunity for a lot of companies to, to take stock mm -hmm. and to reassess. Um, uh, and so I think There'll be a, a lot of um, a, a lot of rebooting going on, um, you know, across different industries. Okay, good. Tim, what's your word? Uh, yeah, I, th I think I'll take a glass half full approach. I, I think opportunity. I think there's an opportunity for everyone in this market. I think there's an opportunity for landlords to get close to their tenants or their customers and have conversations about what the future could hold, about what they can do to work together collaboratively. I think. Occupiers can have an opportunity to sort of reassess their leases, um, look at the terms, try and negotiate more favourable terms at some point. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think as this keeps bubbling along and it ebbs and flows, I think there is an opportunity for everyone to sort of look at how they do things differently as well. So businesses can look at their operational models and how they can do it differently. Mm -hmm. You know, that reliance on China, people can diversify. So I, I think it's actually an exciting year. I think, um, you know, with, with any with any negative situation, which this could be perceived, there comes opportunity. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's, it could be a good year. Good. Christine? Mm, I would say um, unprecedented. Unprecedented, because okay. this is uh, something we have not expected for uh, the longest time. I think everyone is caught off guard. Um, but what's interesting coming out from this COVID-19 situation is that we realise how dependent is the world on China. Mm. And uh, previously, a lot of Chinese manufacturers, they were reluctant to actually move their business outside China. But after this episode, I think they will revisit their strategy to really look at Southeast Asia because uh, the trade will actually push some companies to mm. consider some of this uh, movement, internationalization. Mm. And I think with the COVID-19 episode, a lot of people will really seriously consider moving their operations out of China. So in mm. the foreseeable future, we will see not just China being the manufacturing node for the world, actually we will have a mini node maybe in Southeast Asia, in, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Thailand. And these are going to help Singapore um, because Singapore will become the hub of all this centre. Mm. Yeah. And that's the rest a, of the Southeast Asian countries will I was going to say that's a really important a point. Pickup, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, Christina just touched on there, obviously the reassessment of China is the sole provider Indeed, for so many yeah. products and, and services and industries. I think without a doubt, we've already seen over the last couple of years um, decentralisation uh, and new investment from many companies that are based out of mainland China, moving into Southeast Asia, um, mm. you know, ensuring their production capacity and, and, and output. And I think if anything, um, since the, you know, the Hong Kong protests, the, the US-China trade war, without a doubt, you know, this is another factor that's uh, encouraging companies to really look at that diversification of manufacturing base and, and where they do business and not being reliant simply on, mm. uh, on, on mainland China. Well, I think, Stuart, you're going to have a very interesting year ahead or years ahead as uh, the head of logistics and industrial for, for Southeast Asia, isn't it? Uh, lots of, of things moving going on. To Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> the timing of moving out of China was great. But, you know, we, we still very much, you know, obviously China's a, you know, a very important part, 20% of global GDP. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's still a very, very important part, not just globally, but for our region in particular in Asia Pacific. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, we can't just uh, ignore 
uh, you know, the, the benefits that we've all gained from uh, the China story in the last decade or mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what's happening now is that we'll see the benefits in Southeast Asia, uh, hopefully uh, rewarding us all here in Singapore. Fantastic. I hope so. Well, as for me, um, I will actually pick Fortify as my word for 2020. Um, you know, I hope everyone could make use of this um, subdued market conditions um, to, you know, really reflect and, and strengthen on various aspects, be it our products, um, our services, uh, team capabilities and so on, um, so that uh, there is no doubt that the market will rebound. And so we just need to be prepared, you know, uh, Fortify, and then to make sure that we um, reboot ourselves um, to capture the opportunities, right? Um, and so I think um, it's going to be a great year ahead, guys. I think that's a good point. I think, you know, everyone does need to pull together in times like this. So mm -hmm. landlords, occupiers, uh, investors, everyone needs to come together because everyone's going to feel it in some capacity. So it shouldn't be about winning and losing. It should be about trying to work together to get good outcomes. So, yeah, I think that's a really important sort of um, approach to take. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, so we have come to the end of this um, session. A uh, big thank you to all our panelists for their views and um, everybody who are watching this um, video right now. And so stay healthy and we'll see you next time. <laughs>